Well, good morning. I, I love our kiddos, man. I love the energy they, they bring to the service. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And if you were here last week, we, we started, um, I told you I was going to do a couple of messages on out of Ephesians chapter 4. And we're keeping the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So we are where we talked last week about individually uh, beginning with the end in mind. But today we're going to talk collectively. So <clears throat> I'm going to get to the word of God in, in just a moment. But it's great to see you. it really is. We we you know, we hear, uh, man, just tons of people struggling with uh sickness right now, whether it's the COVID stuff or whether it's just allergies, man, it's just uh, a booger. So uh, uh, that's just kind of the way things are. And I say that I'm going to have to cough. <coughs> uh, as soon as I said that, a cough came in. So uh, I probably caught something in the early service from being at the door. Uh, what is this? A baton. Uh, use it for relay races. Uh, in the year 2000, the Summer Olympics were held in Sydney, Australia. And when it came to the 4x100 relay, the American women were uh, tops. They were the most experienced. They were the best athletes. Uh, everything about them just said uh, that the gold medal was going to be theirs. And so the gun goes off, and sure enough, they take off. And, and the first leg, um, we're, it looks like we're going to have the lead. But you know, the most important thing in the relay is that handoff. And so when the first girl handed off to the next girl, that they, they fumbled the baton a little bit. They didn't drop it, but the race is so fast that uh, they lost about a tenth of a second. And they ended up losing the gold medal by 0.25 of a second. And uh, so even though they were the most talented and the best athletes and the best trained athletes and the most experienced, they still lost because of the handoff. So we go four years into the future. 2004 Olympics were in Athens, Greece. And uh, once again, our ladies, best athletes, um, uh, fastest ladies in the world, basically, and uh, best trained, most experienced, uh, favored to win the gold. They take off, and uh, they're, they're looking good. But I, I think it was the third handoff that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're handoff on a relay, especially a sprint relay, you have a passing lane. You have a, a zone that you have to make the pass during that zone. And sure enough, the, the handoff got, by the time it was finished, our runner was out of the zone. So they got disqualified because they were out of the zone. So they were the most experienced, best athletes, but because they missed the pass, they, they uh, were disqualified. Go four years into the future, 2008, Beijing, Beijing Olympics. Uh, once again, our ladies are gold medal favorites, um, most experienced, best athletes. And lo and behold, what happened in this one was they actually dropped the baton. And so they ended up losing the race because once you drop it, Man, they're flying, everybody's flying around that track. There's no way you're going to catch up. So we go four years more into the future. The next Olympics, we're in London, 2012 Olympics in London. And sure enough, that people are thinking, would tragedy strike again the U.S. Uh, 4x100 ladies sprint relay? And uh, lo and behold, they... First runner takes off and hands it to the second runner. Clean handoff. Second runner hands it off to the third runner. Clean handoff within the zone. The third runner hands it off to uh, the fourth runner. And sure enough, man, she sprints across 
with a gold medal. And they, they got the gold medal and they shattered a 20-year record that had been in the 4 by 100 ladies relay. And what was the difference? They were still experienced. They were still greatly trained. They were favored. But what was the difference? It was because they handled the handoff correctly and the passing of the baton uh, made them made them what they were by shattering a 20-year world record record. The church was birthed when Jesus Christ was crucified, he rose from the dead, and 50 years later his Holy Spirit came and inhabited those followers and the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ was birthed. And it was like once it started there in that first century, then along comes another century and they handed the baton off to that century. Another one happens, they hand it off to the next generation and the next generation. And now it's come to our generation. And so we take the baton. So what is the baton? The baton to me is the commission that God has given us. It's the uh, anointing and empowering of His Holy Spirit to go forth and to do the things that God desired for His church body. And all of a sudden, here we come along, and now we have the baton. And so as we think about that, what, what can we say about our current generation of church as we take the baton? And I, I sometimes feel a little bit guilty because we live in a very affluent times where people would say, you know, the church is man well taken care of. There's more money, there's more equipment, there's more capabilities of getting the gospel around the world. The church uh, should have no problem in getting the gospel out around the world. But yet, we have seem to have lost some of that anointing and that uh, empowering that comes from God's Spirit. And so the, the question we ask about the church in this generation is, will this be the generation that sees revival around the world? Will this be the generation that so falls in love and step with Jesus that the world has to stand up and take notice? Will this be the generation where every believer is using his or her giftings to build up the body of Christ? Or will this be the generation that sees the church become an afterthought and irrelevant in our day? Will this become the generation where we turn the church into a spectator event instead of a moving force with the Great Commission? Will this be the generation that actually departs from his first love instead of flaming for him? I, I sometimes get with other pastors and we talk and, and, and we, we're, we try not to be too hard on our time, but we're thinking, am I going to be a pastor that's leading a congregation in the times that our nation becomes anti-Christian? Am I going to be a leader? I mean, I, I can't imagine standing before the Lord and Him saying, oh yeah, you were pastoring in America, the most affluent place on the planet, when they turn their back on the church. I, I just, I hear that and I think about that and I cringe as a leader. And so... I think about, as we think about keeping the end in mind, last week we talked about individually. What, what does it look like for me as an individual follower of Jesus Christ? Where today we're going to talk about the collective. What does it look like uh, when, when the church of Jesus Christ is moving and we begin with the end in mind? This is where we're headed. So Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 through 16. I read it last week, but let me read it to you again just so that it will uh, penetrate and you can, you can kind of tear apart what God is saying here. Verse 11, And He, being uh, 
the, Jesus Christ gave the Holy Spirit who gave us giftings and gave us um, church leaders. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip uh, uh, or to mend up. The, it's almost like mending up nets. He, he sent them to equip the saints. These are the disciples of Jesus Christ, the followers of Christ. Uh, look to the person next to you and say, you're a saint. And uh, just tell them uh, whether they believe it or not, doesn't matter. The scriptures call us as followers of Jesus saints. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Notice why the equipping comes. It comes to build up the body, which is the, the church of Jesus Christ. So, until 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cutting, cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. The picture that Paul is giving here is actually uh, when he says cunning and craftiness in deceitful schemes. It's the picture of a guy that knows how to manipulate dice. He, 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 he knows how to manipulate them in such a way that it's deceiving other people. And that's the picture. We're going to be, if we do not get a firm foundation, we're going to be manipulated by deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So, let me kind of set you up and then we're going to talk about four, I believe the four desires, beginning with the end in mind. We're thinking about the end in mind. I want to share with you four desires of God. But let's look at the church just a second. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the big C church. I'm not talking about um, central per se. Even though we are but a small cell in the big C body of Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. You know, if you lose your head, uh, you cut your head off, you're gone. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I, I've seen people lose limbs and, uh, and they still exist. I've seen people who, who uh, lose function in so many areas, but if they have their head and the brain waves are going, of course the heart is beating, you're going to continue to exist. But I do know this that you lose your head, and uh, you're gone. Now, it may be empty right now, but, but, uh, but still, you lose your head, and you're gone. So Christ is the head of the church. Everything ought to flow from Him. And, and Paul uses terminology that the church of Jesus Christ is a body. And the body has different parts. You can read about it in Corinthians a little bit more. And the object is for every believer to mature and to be equipped to build up the body of Christ. And Christ is the head. It's, all glory goes to Him. And the body, Paul, Paul says it right here, is joint and held together. It's continuous. This is a continuous action verb. In other words, the body is continually being fitted together for the function. So, the way I look at it, let's be very practical right quick. Central is a, is a congregation that exists in Round Rock, Texas in 2022 for such a time as this. And God has supplied everything we need 
so that if the body is working properly, it will give him glory. Okay? So that's what a practical sense. Now, I want to give you four things, though, that I think God desires. And, and please understand, I'm preaching to myself as I share these things. Number one is this. His desire is to bring His body together to exalt and worship Him. Let me read it again. His desire is to bring His body together to exalt and worship Him. Okay? He's not a megalomaniac. Somebody can think, well, if, that's a, if there's a God out there and He just exists, He wants His people to bow down to Him, He must be some kind of egomaniac, megalomaniac that exists. No, that's not the case. He loves us so much, He knows that life only makes sense when we're closely related to Him. And there's nothing closer than just the worship that we have of Him. So when He asks us to worship, when He commands us to worship, then it is for our good. So, practical. We do not exist to entertain. Yes, there's a lot of talent on this platform, but they do not exist. The church does not exist to entertain. And anything that we plan as far as a worship service, this is not a great marketing ploy, but I'm going to be honest with you. What is planned is not for you. It's for God alone. And that's that's not popular in our day. In fact, that can empty a church more than anything. But what has happened in the church in the West especially is that we feel like we got to fill these seats up and so we're going to going to tone things down and make things palpable so that you enjoy it. And when you walk away at the end of this service, you're going to go have a meal or whatever you're going to do. You're going to go into your afternoon and somebody's going to ask you, how was your worship? today. And you may say things like, well, it was pretty good. They sang a song that I enjoyed and I still got it going in my head. There was there was something that said that kind of stirred me a little bit. My friends were there, so I had a good experience with my friends. Or you may say something like, uh, the message was a little too long. Um, it, it wasn't interesting. It didn't affect me. The music was a little loud. And the question is not so much what you got out of worship. It was, you ought to ask yourself, was the Father pleased with my heart in worship today? That is what the question we need to ask. So when Brett and his team plan. Yes, they're, they're looking at songs that are pleasant. We, we don't feel like we're called to give Gregorian chants right now. But God says it, we're going to do it. But it's what's going to please His heart. And the Father's desire is for us to worship Him. Because life only makes sense. It only makes sense as we draw near to Him. And it's just a matter of time that if you do not catch that, that you will go looking elsewhere because somebody can do this better. Everybody. And we have a lot of talent. But it's unto Him alone. So His desire is that we come together to worship Him. Secondly, His desire is for His body to use their gifts and enablements to build up His body. His desire is for His body to use their gifts and enablements to build up His body. Every believer who came to Christ, the Holy Spirit has given you certain empowering, certain enablements, and certain giftings that aren't aren't there to puff you up. 
They're there to build up his body. And so uh, my question is, have you discovered, you know, those enablements in, inside of you, those giftings inside of you to build up the body of Christ? Because not only if, if you worship the Father, if you think worship is for you, there is a termination date on how long you will be here. If you do not learn your giftings and enablements to serve the body of Christ, and you think it's just about you receiving, it, there will be a termination date when you will leave as well. Because you have to come to the point where you're giving yourself away for the sake of His body. Why? To build up the body. You know, I'm going to give a, a sports analogy. I sometimes give sports illustrations and people tune me out, but that's just part of me. In the college sports right now, something has developed over the last couple of years that didn't exist before. You know, a college coach goes out, he recruits the best players, high school players, he recruits them, sits down in their home, shares with them why he would like for them to come to his school. It's a, a real tedious thing. And so uh, he, he recruits that young man or young lady, whoever he recruits, they come to the college and they play that year. Now, used to be he would recruit them. They would stay there for four years, and their eligibility, play that out, and they would be loyal to that school. Something's happened over the last couple of years called the transfer portal. In other words, what happens is a young man, young lady comes to that school, plays a year. They may be super good or they may be behind somebody else and they get a burr under their saddle or they think I can go to where the grass is greener and they enter the transfer portal to go to another school. So what a coach has to do now he not only has to recruit the high school kid to try to get him, but he has to recruit his own players that he's recruited before. He's got to keep them happy so that they'll stick around. Where I'm going with this is this. In the church in America, there's been a transfer portal a long time. And people, people have to be coddled to stick around while you're trying to reach the lost. And so... There's this question of how much energy do we expend to make sure we keep everybody we got plus go out and reach the lost. And so you can see how that can water down if people do not serve. And so there has to be that serving, that giving away. Uh, Renee and our hospitality team and, and with Brett, they have developed a servant central sheet. You've probably seen these, uh, are the people that come to intro get one, they're on the table out there. What it is, is a, uh, it's needs within the body. I'm not talking about your neighborhood or your workplace or your school. I'm talking about just within the body, needs that are there, uh, maybe unmet, maybe uh, needing more people, anywhere from hugging on children to uh, a media worship, student ministry, kids ministry, missions, uh, making coffee. I mean, it's, it's all on here. You might want to pick the one up because you think, you know, I've been taking and not giving, and maybe because God has given me certain gifts and enablements, and I, I need to use those. And, and let me ask you this question. What's your, your family like? Because... Everybody in your family has certain responsibilities. You, you teach your kids when they're little, we want you to clean your room, but we want you to take the trash out. As they get older, we want you to, uh, we want you to mow the yard. We want you to do these things. And everybody has their role that they play within the family. And some may be good, some are, are growing into them, but everybody has a role in your family. If you're not doing that, you need to do that, parents. You need to give your kids responsibilities so that they fulfill those roles. It's the same way within the body of Christ. We're a family. Everybody has a role, and when your role is not being fulfilled, that role is empty. 
or somebody is burning out covering too many roles. And so uh, that the church ought to never have to plead for people to serve. Should never. Because the scriptures are automatic that when the Holy Spirit came upon you, He equipped you to serve. And so, here's a thought. Are you an attender or an owner? I, I, I go over this most intros. I don't, I don't think I did it last week. But there's a difference between attenders and owners. And when I say owners, I'm talking about membership. But attenders, let's say... Let's say we're walking across the parking lot and an attender will say, man, why don't they pick up the garbage in the parking lot? Or why don't they do this? Or why don't they do that? An owner picks up the trash. You see the difference? Uh, if you're waiting on somebody else to do something now, Somebody may have that responsibility, and you're asking, does somebody have that responsibility? And, but there's a difference. And, and listen, in God's kingdom, I really believe as I read the Word of God, we become partakers of that body. We become part of that body. So God's desire is for His body to use her gifts and enablement. Number three. His desire is for His body to give a visible display of the kingdom life here on earth. His desire is for His body to give a visible display of the kingdom life here on earth. In other words, His body ought to be displaying what the Scriptures talk about. And you can't read the Scriptures without finding... So many of the one another passages. We are to love one another. We are to serve one another. We are to rejoice with one another. We are to live in harmony with one another. We are to be devoted to one another. We are to build up one another. We are to forgive one another. We are to pray for one another. We are to weep with one another. There are so many one another's. And if we as the body of Christ and the family of Christ followers are doing those one another's, then it gives a visible display to those that don't know Christ in the world. It shows His kingdom. And I sometimes wonder, what does the world think and see from the body of Christ? Do they see us loving one another? Do they see us serving one another? Do they see us loving our enemies even? Do they, do they see these things? And I think sometimes they, what they see, and, and, the, and the devil does a good job of, of showing them warts and all, but do they not see division? Do they not see judgment? Do they not see exclusion? Do they not see anger? Or do they truly see the love of Christ on display? Sacrificially, unconditionally, what do they see? Man, isn't that convicting? To me, to me it is. I just wonder what our world sees so much. Um, I get concerned. I, I get concerned when I read about Christians doing certain things I, I, I got to be honest, uh, I, I don't like to spend time on Facebook. Uh, I, I like to go to Facebook uh, to see pictures and this kind of stuff. But, I, man, I, I'll see a church member post something, and I'm thinking, oh, brother. Oh, brother. That's, uh, that's not good. That's good. Uh, and so... Uh, what does the world see? Let me give one more. Hopefully you're taking notes and you can get them off the, off the board. But last one is this. His desire is for his body to be salt and light in her sphere of influence. His desire is for his body to be salt and light in her sphere of influence. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you're the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt has lost its flavor, it's good for nothing being thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. And then he says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a bowl, but to put it on a table and gets light to all that are in the house. And, and then he says this, In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Are we being salt and light? We're, we're called to be salt and light. I think Round Rock and the surrounding area should be a better place because we are here. People should be able to get answers to life's questions because the church is here to lead them to the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of life. We represent Him to this world. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're salt and light. We're, we ought to be drawing people to Him. I was reading in Matthew 21 the other day about Jesus' triumphal entry, that last entry into Jerusalem. And, and uh, everybody's yelling and screaming and, and these kind of things are happening. And, and the Scripture says this, the entire city was in an uproar as he entered and they said, basically, who is he? The whole, the entire city was in an uproar as he entered. And they asked, who is he? Here's the deal. When we're being salt and light, it is an attraction to Jesus. Wouldn't it be incredible if our whole city in this entire area was in an uproar because they were seeing something? And they ask, who is he? Who is he? Who is he? His desire is for us to be salt and light in our sphere of influence that we have right here. Last week I talked about individually. Today I talk about where we are as a church collectively, beginning with the end in mind. This is where we're headed. It's not bigger buildings. It's not even more people, it's, it, we want to be uh, something that gives glory to God. And, and the older I get, when I see um, the days of my influence waning a little bit as far as my role, because as you get older, uh, I, I understand things. I'm, I'm wise enough to understand things. And I, so I pray, God, just do it. Bring revival. To our land. Bring it. You know, I, I I talked about relay earlier, and we uh we've been given the baton. So here's what I, I want to do. Um I gotta look at you first because you're you're not gonna make eye contact with me. Uh uh Hey Linda, how are you doing today? You know, we sang Living Hope. Man, I can't help but think of Don. Is your knee doing okay? Okay, can you help me with something right quick? Uh, I'm sorry, Linda. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Uh, Linda, you're going to help me. Okay. No, 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 no. Hold that just a second, okay? All right. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Christy, can you help me over there? It's I'm not going to embarrass you. Just we're going to run a relay is what we're going to do, and uh, if you don't mind uh, being right over there, uh, hey Jacob, can you help me? Uh, Jacob, one of our single young adults, uh, got some nice hair, ja Jacob. <laughs> Jacob, right there in the middle. Uh, give me, a, give me a student track student. Harrison, Harrison, go, go right over there. Go right over, go, right over there, Harrison. Okay, all right, right, right there. Okay, this is our track. And first of all, give our athletes a hand. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Don't, don't run. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, don't run, Linda. And so uh, what I want you to do is we're going to 
have the gun go off, and I want you to walk around there and hand the baton off to Christy. Okay? Ready? Bang! The gun goes off. Kill! Come on! Come on! Come on! Cheer on! Cheer on! Go, Linda! Go, Linda! Go, Linda! Man! Woo! Go, Christy! Go, Christy! Woo! Go, Christy! Come on! Go, Christy! All right. Back stretch. Jacob, there you go. In the passing lane. Oh! Woo! Man! All right. Harrison, bring it home. Bring it home, Harrison. Woo! All right. Okay. Now, we're going to do it again. Uh, Jacob, Linda, come on back. Yeah, go back to your spot. Jacob, man, young, young bucks took off on me. Okay. Now, that, that was a basic relay. No, 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 Linda, Linda. But I think with the church, it's a little bit different. And so this time, what I want you to do, Linda, is I want you to go and hand it off to Christy. But instead of stopping, I want you to join Christy to come around to Jacob. And then y'all join Jacob. And Harrison, do not run. <laughs> Ready? Bang! There we go. There we go. There we go. Go. Linda had a knee replacement last year, and she's got it happening. All right, Christy, here we go. Here we go. Woo! Here we go. Come on. Backstretch, backstretch. Here we go, Jacob. Here we go. Go, Jacob. Go, go, go. Woo! There we go. There we go. They're hanging in there. Hanging in there. Hold on tight, Harrison. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Home stretch. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Woo! All right. Here comes the church in the home stretch. Woo! Church in the home stretch. All right. All right. Okay. Give them a hand. Woo! All right. Y'all can have a seat. Here's the deal. God has given our generation the baton. You notice I had a different generation in every re part of the relay. Because the church, I can never come to the point in my lifetime where I can say, oh, I've given it off to them. Man, they can go do it now. I can take a break. You see, the church is multi-generational. And until we come into the home stretch to hear our fathers say, well done, we're going to continue to run together. And that's what God has called at least me as your pastor to lead us according to the Word of God. You may be here today and you don't know Christ. You're not part. I mean, you, you're religious, but you don't know Jesus Christ. But yet there's something in your heart that's saying, I need Jesus. And so I'm going to just challenge you. He says that He is a free gift to anyone who would ask. And so I'm just going to challenge your heart. I want all of you to bow your heads with me for just a moment.